Are you happy to be in God's house? Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, you can say you're one of the ones that have got affected by any kind of sickness, and you got to come to the house of the Lord today. Amen. 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 We got a lot out sick today. We just need to pray the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 But if nothing else, I want you to praise him and give him thanks that he was able to get you here today. Because I know the Amen. others want to be here. But God's blessings brought you here. So let's give him the praise he deserves and sing, Lord, you are good. <clears throat>
like we need this next song this morning. He touched me. How many of you need a touch this morning? I think the whole congregation does. I think we all do. Let's sing He Touched Me. And as you're singing it this morning, I want you to just close your eyes and just worship God and just envision Him touching you from your head to your toe. And whatever you've got going on today, I promise you, He'll take care of it. Amen?
Good morning. Do you realize this is the first Sunday in the year 2020? You're in God's house, and I'm just so glad you're here. I, I was thinking when we were singing, the song says, He touched me. You know, God is always wanting to touch his children. But did you realize sometimes we, his children, don't want his touch? We're too busy with our touching. There's a scripture about the woman with the issue of blood that she made her way into the multitude and she touched the hem. <laughs> of Jesus' garment. And do you remember what the scripture said? Jesus said, who touched me? Church, I want you to know, Jesus wants you this morning to touch him. He said, I know somebody touched me because power left my body and healed the person that touched me. Do you need a healing this morning? Do you need a touch this morning? God wants to touch, but we've got to reach and touch him. Let me just welcome you. We've got a number of visitors. We want to always welcome you. And I look and you really are not visitors. You're just home folks. And we welcome you this morning. 
our pastor is sick this morning, so I want you to keep him in our prayers. Let me, how many of you know that we have a prayer list in the foyer as you're coming in? It's got the names of all of our people that wanted to be put on the prayer list. I'm not going to call. We have so much sickness going around. I'm not going to call the names of any of our people that are sick. God already knows it. But let me tell you something. I've, a lot of people call me weird. <laughs> and that may be true. But you know what? When I call a name of anybody that's sick, I don't want to give the devil any credit in this house because sickness doesn't come from God. It comes from the devil. God is saying, if you will touch me, I'll take care of you. So I just want you this morning, as we pray, I want you to lift up needs. I want you to lift up names, whatever's on your heart. There's been tragedies that have happened. God knows about it, but God wants us to let him touch us as we touch him. So let's just go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, as we've assembled this morning, we've assembled to worship you. God, you said in your word, when we are weak, that you will make us strong. And God, as I was just sharing, I don't want to give Satan one ounce of attention. I don't want to give Satan one obvious sound of fear from me. Because, Satan, you have no control over God's children. But God, sometimes we sit back and we worry and we say, God, what would happen if this comes or that comes? God, we're not going to fear this morning. You're not the author of fear. You're not the author of confusion. I rebuke Satan this morning from this pulpit because he has no power here. He has no place here. And there is not one illness. There is not one sickness. There is not one person that's going through struggles that if we can just reach and touch the hem of your government, God, every, everyone will be healed. So God, that's what we're doing this morning. We're here to worship you. We're here to praise you. You're the one that paid a price and gave your life, shed your blood so that we could be saved. And as we receive that salvation, that's your touch, then we touch you this morning by reaching up and say, God, I'm your child. What would you have me do? And God, as we go through the furtherance of this service, we thank you for the praise songs. We thank you for the prayers. God, we thank you for the worship. We thank you for your presence in this sanctuary. And God, I pray that you will bless Dawson this morning as he comes to share 
the word that you've given him. God, help us to be attentive to receive. And help us to be willing not only to receive, but to share the word that we've received. And God, we want to give you all the glory. We want to give you all the praise. And God, I pray that your spirit would just fall in this congregation this morning to correct, to heal, to restore, to strengthen whatever the needs are. God, you said that if you will just trust me, I will supply all of your needs in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus' name, this morning, we pray and we thank you. And we just pray and we just say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> If the ushers would come forth, once again, I think we get in a routine. We come in, we sing a song, sing several songs, we have a prayer, we have the offering, we have a message, we have a prayer, we close. Church, let's not get in a routine. What a joy it is to come and sing praise. What a joy it is to still live in a land where we can pray in the name of Jesus. What a joy it is to be able to return to God just a portion of what he has given us. So as we Receive the offering. You just let God touch you. You do what God tells you to do. God will bless you. Father, God, once again, had it not been for your love, had it not been for your sacrifice, God, there would none of us be able to come and say thank you. But God, you have done and we do say thank you. Now we ask you to bless this offering. God, as we pass these offering plates, you just gain glory and honor for the return of a portion of what you have done for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. As the children are putting their money into their, the offering, we appreciate what they do to give their offerings for the month for the building fund. Since they use the buildings also, we appreciate what they do. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, so much for this opportunity, the very first Sunday that we can begin the year off with the privilege, with the joy of sharing what we have back to you. It is an honor that we can give of what we have back to you. We ask that you take this offering, how we give it with our joy, and we ask that you bless it and that you use it to the best way that it can be used for this church and for this community. Bless everyone and all the hands and everything that was used to put in this offering. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys hear me? There it is. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> you ended it off last year with me. Now you get to start off this year with me. It's so good to be in the house of God this morning, isn't it right? All right. Uh, thank you, band. Thank you, choir, for being up here, um, singing, giving your hearts to the Lord um, as we praise Him this morning. Uh, so 2020. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about something that can propel you further in 2020 to more and more victories and more and more seeing what God wants to do in your life. And so this morning, this is something that we can all take something from. This is for people that are sitting in a place where they really don't know what to do next. This is for people sitting in a place where they just feel hopeless. And so this morning, we're going to see how Jesus approaches the man who was hopeless. And we're going to see how he uses that, that situation and his hopefulness to turn it for good, just like he always does. So if you'll turn with me to John chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1. But before we get started, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you so much for being in your house this morning. Uh, God, we thank you so much for this word that you've given me. God, I pray this morning that you will speak through me and that hearts and minds are changed this morning because of the word that you've given me and the words that you speak through me, God. So God, as we enter this time of listening and to, to dwell upon your word, I pray that um, hearts are open, minds are open to what you have them to receive. And so in your name, your name we pray, amen. So John chapter 5, this is the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And so, let's read, starting in verse 1, it says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there, is a, now, excuse me, now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is in Aramaic, the, uh, is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie. A blind, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? And so the first thing I want you guys to realize this morning is that the Lord has a divine purpose and direction for both his and our destinations. See, before he came to Bethesda, Jesus I'm talking about, before he came to Bethesda, according to the book of John, everywhere he went, he had a purpose for it. He starts off, in Cana, in Galilee, where he turned the water into wine. 
And then he goes to Capernaum with his family. And then he goes to Jerusalem where he talks to Nicodemus. He had a purpose for talking to Nicodemus. He talks about how to be born again. He tells Nicodemus, Nicodemus that you are one of Israel's teachers and you still don't know this yet? Nicodemus' heart was changed in that moment. Then he leaves Nicodemus and goes to the Judean countryside. This is where John the Baptist is in Anon, and he's baptizing people. And then Jesus comes along, and people are leaving John the Baptist to go see Jesus. And this is where John has a change of heart, and where he realizes that his ministry is done. And this is where he utters out these famous words, he must decrease, and I must increase. Or he must increase, and I must decrease. Let's not get that twisted. And then, when he leaves there, he goes to Samaria. He goes to Sychar. You see the woman at the well. And we all know that story. Her heart was changed because of an encounter with Jesus at the well. He says, I'm the living water. You don't need to be thirsty ever again because I'm the living water. Then he lives there, then he leaves there and goes to Galilee. And here we see a religious official or, a, or an official. His son is sick and he comes um, to see Jesus about 15 miles out of his way to come see Jesus to heal his son. And Jesus said, you can go back home, your son's healed. And the official goes back home. When he gets home, they say, oh, your son's healed. He said, what time was he about healed? He said, about so-and-so in the afternoon. He said, oh, wow, this is the Messiah. Because he spoke one word and my son was healed. This is about the time he did it. And so then he leaves there and goes back to Jerusalem. And now we see there's a Jewish festival happening. We don't, it's not clear which one it is, but there's a Jewish festival happening. And Jesus is here in Jerusalem now, but his purpose wasn't to go to the festival. Not in this moment it wasn't anyways. His purpose was to come see this one man laying on a mat at Bethesda. And we see that this man was a part of Jesus' plan, of Jesus' divine purpose to come see him because of heart change. And we see that when we see that what happened here after what happened here, this man that was laying on this mat was free of every situation that he's gone through the past 38 years because of what Jesus did. But if it wasn't for Jesus' purpose and if it wasn't for God's divine plan for that to happen, this man would have never been healed. It's the same thing for us, guys. Same thing for us. God has a strict divine purpose for our lives, and yet we still sit here at this mat because this is where we want to be. But when Jesus comes and meets us where we're at, and that's what he does. He comes and meets us where we're at and changes our lives. He doesn't expect us to sit here anymore. He doesn't. He wants us to get up and go and walk. And that's what we're going to learn about today. How we, sitting on our hopelessness and our helplessness, when Jesus comes and changes our lives, then we can get up and claim our victory and go. So we have to realize that we have a purpose. By Jesus dying on the cross for us, he has a purpose for our lives. We are wanted. We are chosen. 1 Peter 2.9 says we are a chosen race. And in the same verse it says that we are God's special possession. Special possession. Not just a possession. His special possession. We are wanted. And because we have a purpose, we are chosen. Oh, we're going to end right there. I'm just kidding. Guys, that's victory. That's victory. God gives us a purpose. So when we feel like we're hopeless, when we feel like we're helpless, remember that Jesus gives you a purpose because of what he did on the cross. Amen, church. Amen. In one word, God can do anything that he wants to. In one thought, in one snap of his finger, God can do anything he wants to. But yet he still chooses us to be a part of his purpose. That's why we serve him. That's why we choose him. That's why we're thankful for him. Because God doesn't need us. He doesn't. I remember, remember last week I talked about we're not worthy. We are not. Not by ourselves, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, he makes us worthy. It's not because of anything that we did. God doesn't need us. 
He doesn't need me to be standing here on this stage. He doesn't need Pastor Danny to be standing here on this stage every Sunday. But because he chose him to be here, he is. God doesn't need us. He has a divine purpose for our lives. A divine plan to share the glory of his gospel and to share his love with everybody on the earth. And he chooses us to do it. Even though he could do it himself. He wants us to be a part of it. He wants us to share in his eternal glory. We have to realize that, church. We have to realize that. So moving on, verse 6, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? <laughs> I love this question. Because it's so weird. <laughs> Jesus asked the weirdest questions sometimes, and this time he asked the man, Do you want to get well? Can you imagine the man sitting there? Do you want to get well? Duh! <laughs> you think I've been sitting here for 38 years and I don't want to get well? Like, you see, that's what Jesus did. He, but he asked that question for a reason. And here in a minute we're going to see why. So verses 7 through 9, it says, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. So we see here the man's answer wasn't yes. It wasn't duh to Jesus' question. Instead, what he does, he doesn't answer with straightforward yes or no. He answers with an excuse. He answers with an excuse. You see, a lot of us do that, don't we? We sit here in our helplessness and our hopelessness. And Jesus comes to us. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to claim your victory today? What do we do? Well, God, if only my life was better. If only my kids were better. If only my parents were better. If only my job was better. If I had a better paying job, God, then I'd start paying taxes. Or taxes, tithes. <laughs> Hope you're paying your taxes. God, I want to serve you, but I'm afraid they're going to make fun of me. We make excuses. You see, when the man was sitting here and he starts making excuses, that means he was settling for where he was. He was settling for where he was. And when you settle, you lose faith. When you're comfortable, you lose faith. The man sit, sat there and said, if only I had someone to take me to the pool, then I could be healed. Without even realizing that his healing was standing right in front of him. And we do that, church. We sit here in our hopelessness. And we want to get better, we do. But we sit here without realizing that we serve Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means? God our provider. God, our provider. We forget that we serve the God of the impossible. This man thought his situation was impossible. But what happens? He said, get up and walk. And he did. But see, he would have never done that if he had stayed down. If he had stayed laying there, he would have never gotten healed. Settling is dangerous. That's my point up here. Settling is dangerous. Because when we settle, we lose faith. We don't, want to, we don't want God to stretch us. We don't want God to use us. And you may not physically be saying, God, I don't want you to use me. But by sitting here, 
That's what you're telling him. We don't want God to do that because we're comfortable. We're comfortable. Nobody's faith has ever been made stronger by being complacent. It's when God takes you, about, takes you on on those waters. It's when God stretches your faith that you become stronger. It's when you don't know, it's when your faith is made stronger. Faith begins where understanding ends. I didn't say that. That was something that I saw in another sermon that I was listening to. But I thought it was so good I had to say it. Faith begins where understanding ends. This man was sitting here, laying down here. His faith was shattered. It's impossible for me to get up. He didn't understand how Jesus can tell him to get up and he get up and walk. But because he had enough faith to stand up, you see that he was healed. But he would have never done that if he had never stood up. If he had believed the lies of the enemy saying that you will never stand up, you will be here for the rest of your life, then he would have never been healed. But because he had enough faith to believe in what, the, what Jehovah Jireh told him to do, he stood up and what happened? He was healed. We know that. God told Abram, before he was Abraham, I want you to move away from all your family all of your friends to go to a land that I will show you. He didn't say this land over here. He didn't say where his land was. He just said, I want you to leave to a land that I will show you. And what did Abram do? He packed up all his stuff and left. A lot of us, if God were told us, I want you to leave where you're at, a lot of us would be like, why? Abram did it without question. The Bible tells us he just immediately went. But a lot of us would say, why? Why do you want me to leave? I don't want to leave my friends. I don't want to leave my situation. I don't want to leave where I'm comfortable. I'm settled. I'm good. Be careful. Because Abram became the father of many nations after he left. Let me tell you, church, God wants to do something great in you, but some of us are sitting in a place where we can't because we want to accept what God has for us. Do you realize that? We're sitting in a place of comfortability. We're sitting in a place of stability when God wants to stretch your limits and he wants to do something even greater than you than he ever has done, ever done before. But we won't let him. We won't let him. That's our fault. That's our fault. I do the same thing. I'm such a person that wants to be comfortable where I'm at. I want to be safe. I want to be secure. I spend a lot of time at home because I don't want to go outside. <laughs> That's me. And so my constant battle with the Lord is exactly what we're talking about today. Stretching my faith. Getting outside of my comfort zone. Going and talking to people that I don't know for the sake of the gospel. We have to do the same thing. We can't sit here and be comfortable where we're at. That's not how your faith is made stronger. The song by Hillsong says, my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior, but only if you take me to where my trust is without borders. But only where I go out beyond the water. If I go out to where I can't stand up anymore. Settling is dangerous. God told Noah to build a gigantic boat in the middle of the desert. <laughs> That's crazy faith right there. He told Noah to build a gigantic boat in the middle of the desert. Why? Because God said, I'm going to flood the earth, and I want you and your family to be the ones that stay behind. And God did it. 
Do you think Noah knew how to build a boat? Probably not. Most likely not. God, Noah was not a master boat craftsman. I don't know how you put it. He did not build boats for a living. He didn't know how to do that, much less a gigantic one. His faith was tested. He did it because God told him to, not knowing the reason why. We didn't know the reason why. But he didn't know how much, how, he didn't know how many crazy looks he was going to get. And I can imagine it was a lot. He didn't know how many people questioned, is God really going to flood the earth? Is he really going to do that? Noah said, God told me to, so I'm going to do it. A lot of us need to live our lives that way. When people come at us, when people look at us like we're crazy for following God, be like, God told me to do it. It's not me. It's not me. (laughs) See, this is what God chose Noah to do. This is what God chose Abram to do. God has a thing that he's chosen us to do, but we're sitting here asking questions instead of getting up and doing it. Guilty. Guilty. The lame man would have never been healed if he didn't stand up. So church, maybe there's something God wants to do in your life. But you've settled for where you're at. Because maybe what God wants to do is not what you want to do. You get in trouble with that that one a lot, don't we? Maybe God wants to take a toxic person out of your life. Maybe God wants to give you a better job. Maybe God wants to give you better friends. Maybe God wants to give you a better financial situation. Maybe God wants you to, wants to use you to have somebody else come to know him. Maybe God wants to break your addictions. Maybe God wants to change something about you. Maybe God wants to break the chain that's holding you down, but because we're not focused on Him, we won't ever have that healing. We won't ever have that deliverance because we're sitting right here and we're settling for where we are. How sad is that, church? We all do that. I do that. Pastor Danny does that. We all do it. There's something that God wants to do in our lives, but because we're so bound by this thing, we don't want to leave because we become accustomed to it. Church, Guess what? This chain that's holding you down, God wants to break it. But it's because we're sitting here and we're so used to it that we don't want it to leave. (laughs) You guys get that? God today, my next point, He wants you to pick up your mat. Pick up your mat. That's the next point. See, because the mat in this story, represents this man's comfort. It represents this man's situation. It represents what this man was used to. But God, Jesus didn't just tell him to get up. He said, get up and pick up your mat. And you see, this mat for us represents our helplessness. It represents our hopelessness. It represents whatever situation we're in, and God tells us to pick us up. Pick it up. You know why? Because this thing represents that man's control. So now by him picking this up, he now has control over what used to control him for so long. And God wants to do the same for you. He wants to take your situation. He wants to take whatever you've been going through. He wants you to have the victory over it. But we won't do it because we're comfortable. Settling is dangerous, church. This represents our victory. Not that. This represents our victory. We now can have control over what has been controlling us for so long. And yet we choose to leave it on the ground. Come on, church. Come on, church. But also, Jesus didn't just tell him to pick up your mat. 
He didn't just tell him to get up. He said, get up, pick up your mat, and what? Walk. Are you confident enough in our God? Are you confident enough that Jesus has claimed the victory over your life? See, in Joshua, Joshua 10, 8 says, The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not a one of them will be able to withstand you. You see, Joshua had made a deal with the Gibeonites. They had found peace. And the king of Jerusalem didn't like that. So the king of Jerusalem at the time, and four other kings brought them and their armies all to come attack Joshua and the Gibeonites. They were outnumbered. It was impossible. But God looks down at Joshua and says, I have given the victory to you. I have given you the victory. They're not going to be able to withstand you. And Joshua believed it. And later on you see that this was where Joshua told the son to be still. And it was. He told the sun, the thing that is very hot in the summer, okay, to be still, and it was. And because of that, because of that faith, he was able to defeat all five kings and their armies. Because God gave him the power to do it. It wasn't Joshua. It's because Joshua had the faith in his God. He had the faith in Jehovah Jireh. He had his faith in the God of the impossible. And what seems impossible, church, God can do it. This man didn't think he could walk ever again. He didn't think he could walk. But because he had enough faith to believe in Jesus, that he could get up and walk, he got up, picked up his mat, and walked away. Come on, church. You see... Some of us like to sit on our mat and look at everything around us that can cause us not to have this victory. The lame man sat there and Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? I don't have somebody to take me to the pool. Where was the pool? It was over there. I don't have somebody to take me over there. I need somebody to take me over there. A lot of us, when we get in these situations, if only that would happen first. If only I get a better paying job, I can pay my tithes. That's over there. What the man didn't realize is that his healing was standing right here the whole time. His healing was standing right here the whole time. It's not over there. That's what God wants us to do. He wants to realize that our healing is right here. He wants to realize that our salvation is right here. He wants to realize that the answer to our problems is right here. We just have to get up. We just have to get up. Come on, church. By getting up, picking up your mat, and walking, you are claiming the victory that you have in Jesus Christ. You are claiming it. So instead of fixing your eyes on what lies ahead, fix your eyes on what lies above. Because when we realize, when we sit there and focus on what's ahead, we don't ever realize that our healing is right here. Our healing is up there. But when we focus on what's around us, when we focus on the possible, when we focus on the situations, when we focus focus on the logic, We're not putting our faith in the God of the impossible. Come on, church. Some of you today need to get up from where you're at and realize that there's a victory standing right beside you. There's a victory right here. But is your focus out there? Victory doesn't come until you take a hold of what's been controlling you. 
It doesn't come unless you take this mat and pick it up and walk with it. This is our victory. This represented this lame man's victory. He's not a lame man anymore. And what he thought was impossible, God made possible. Because that's how good our God is. Come on, church. That's our victory. We have victory in the name of Jesus Christ today. We have victory over sin. We have victory over addiction. We have victory over pain. We have victory over disease. And yet some of us don't want it. We don't want it. You may not physically say that, but that's what you're implying. Because when you tell God, I don't want what you have for me. When you stay right here, you're telling God, I don't want what you have. I don't want healing. I don't want victory. I don't want it. But you will never have the victory. You will never have the solution. You will never be healed until you get up and pick it up. And now you have control over it. But it's not of anything that you did. It's because we serve a God that's so good to us. It's because we serve a God that is willing to do this for His children. He loves us so much that He sent His own Son to die for us so that we can have the victory over death, hell, and the grave. The last thing. God cares for our hearts over anything else. In verse 14, he says, Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. God cares for our hearts. You see, the reason that Jesus came to this man wasn't for a physical healing. It's for a spiritual healing. This man had become calloused. His faith was made weak. You guys realize that? He lost hope. He lost faith. He didn't know what to believe. He didn't believe that there was going to be somebody coming to him one day, say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. He didn't believe that. See, that's why I think Jesus pointed this specific man out because there's a bunch of people that could have been healed in that moment. But he chose this one person. Why? And we see that his faith had withered. We see that his foundation was gone. We see that his heart had become callous. He didn't believe. He lost hope. Have you lost your hope today? Has your heart become callous? Have you lost your faith? Because you see, we can sit here and say we know God and we believe in God, but until it comes time to show our faith, we wither. Isn't that right, church? The rich young ruler came to Jesus he said, what do I need to do to follow you, Jesus? He said, give up all your possessions. When it comes time to show our faith, church, we wither. Guilty. Guilty. I don't want to talk to people. That's not in my nature. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying, like, it's not in my nature. I, I'm, I don't like talking to people that I don't know. That's a battle I have. That's something that I could claim the victory over myself if I choose to. When it comes time to show my faith, I can do that. Church, when it comes time to show your faith, you have to believe that you serve a God of the impossible. You have to believe that you serve Jehovah Jireh, God a provider. You have to believe that you serve Jesus. Literally, the word Jesus means the God who saves. Jesus has given us the victory over anything. He's given us the victory over death, hell, and the grave. He's given us salvation as a free gift to us, and yet we still don't claim it. Remember last week, I had the gift right here. It's right here waiting on us, church. It's right here. 
God just wants you to take it and open it. We just got done with Christmas. We got a lot of free gifts. Well, they're really not free. A lot of you parents know that. We got a lot of free gifts. And we opened them, and we were all excited. Something that you really want. Who are we to take what we really want and not use it? Who are we to take our Christmas gifts that we really wanted and not use it? What this world needs is a Savior. What God provided was a Savior. He gave us His free gifts. It's right here. And we're still not using it. Who are we to do that? Who are we? God doesn't deserve that. God doesn't deserve that. When Jesus performed this miracle, you see a heart change in this man. You see his faith become stronger. And we see that because one of the first places he goes after he's healed is to the temple. He goes straight to the temple. Praise God. Now he's healed. I have the victory. I've claimed the victory. I'm walking in my victory. Literally. Has your faith become callous, church? Is your heart settled for where you're at right now? Do you think your situation is hopeless? Do you think that there's no answer? There's no way now that my kids can become saved. There's no way now that I can get a better job. There's no way that I can pay my tithe. There's no way that I can serve Jesus. There's no way I can have my salvation because Jesus doesn't love me. That was me, church. I didn't think I was worthy enough for the cross. And truth is, I'm not. But because we serve a God that loves us and trusts us so much, He sent His own Son to die for us. And when Jesus was on that cross, He gave us that salvation. And by resurrecting three days later, he gave us a victory. He gave us a victory over death. Now we have a chance to live eternally with him. We have to realize that, church. We have everything we need in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't need anything else. All I have is all I need. Let me tell you, church. Don't forget that we serve the God of the impossible. When you think your situation is not logical, there's no way on earth that this will happen. Yeah, you're right. There's no way on earth that this is going to happen. God's not on earth. Holy Spirit's on earth. God's presence is on the earth. So the possibility that the impossible can be done is here. It's here, church. It's right here, standing right beside you. You have to realize that. The possible to our impossible is right here. So when you, so in in this upcoming year, when you find yourself in a situation where you think it's impossible, my employees just won't listen to me. My staff just won't listen to me. There's no way that this church can propel and loving Jesus Christ better right now. There's no way that I can do better in school right now. There's no way that I can love this person right now. There's no way that I can pay my tithes right now. There's no way that I can pay my bills right now. We serve a God of the impossible. We serve Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. Because He provides everything that we need. He already has. We just have to claim it. Our healing is right here. And Jesus, and God is looking down on us today saying, get up! Pick it up 
and walk. Get up, church. Get up. Pick up your situation and walk with the victory. Come on, church. Come on, church. This is what God is telling us to do today. For those of you in situations where you feel like the impossible is not possible. Change your heart. Strengthen your faith. Get up. Get up. Come on, church. Come on. God gives us the victory and the control over our circumstances. We just have to trust Him and have faith in Him enough to believe that we can get up and claim the victory and then walk in it. Come on, church. Is there a victory that's waiting on you? Is there something that you need to claim over your life right now? Change your hearts, church, if it's there. Change your hearts. The Lord's waiting on you. He's standing right here for it. You have it right here. He's waiting on you. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Really reflect on it this morning. I have a feeling there's somebody in here that needs to claim it. There's somebody in here that needs to just get up. Your faith has become callous, your faith has become weak. You're waiting on the victory over there. When God is telling you, your victory is right here. Do you need to realize that your victory is right here? Is your focus on the ahead instead of what's above? Does that make sense to you? As we leave here today, I pray that if you're in this situation, that your heart changes. That you realize that your victory is right here. When you feel like it's impossible, we serve a God that controls the impossible. You guys realize that? Our God's so big that He controls everything. In one word, in one touch he can turn the impossible into possible we have to claim it we have to claim it let's pray dear God I thank you so much for who you are I thank you so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for our sins and so that we can have the victory today over everything God help us realize today that the impossible can be made possible because of you that our victory cannot come until we claim it because you give it to us as we start 2020 I pray that we have the necessary vision to realize that you are in control. That maybe you want to stretch our faith. That maybe you want to change our circumstances. You want to give us the solution to our problems. But God, we have to get up. You're telling us to get up. To claim it. So help us do that this morning. Help us do that as we leave here. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. Keep us safe. In your name we pray. Amen.